better get me back, as it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Welcome to Mostly Horror. <laughs> mostly. Mostly. That was He's... good. Nice. Horror. I'm glad, I able, I'm glad I was able to catch you off guard. <laughs> I'm Steve. That's Sean. It's an episode up, today. It's we one of those. are joined. We have and are joined by the showrunner and one of the executive producers and one of the writers and executive producers of Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai out now on Max. That is <laughs> Z Chun and Brendan Hay joining us today to chat about their new animated series uh prequel series of the gremlins films it's a wonderful chat it goes yeah, dude. in all sorts of places and uh they're doing a season it two really so does. hopefully we'll have them we'll have them back yeah. on uh we'll have them back on another time but before we get to that conversation <laughs> there's there is something we can't go without talking about yeah so and, in, yeah. what was it on t- on tuesday tuesday i get a uh a a message from steve and ski steve is uh i almost said skeeve skeeve steve is is nothing if not uh you know the the skeptic the the thinker he wants the facts he wants the car facts he wants the information he wants the proof and i respect that i'm i'm very similar i, I would say I'm my a, money a little less and i need it now yeah if you've been listening I'm just a little less. I'm just a little less skeptical than him, but I'm still pretty skeptical about most things. But I, I get a uh, a link sent to me from Steve, and it's an article, and it says, U.S. urged to reveal UFO evidence after claim that it has intact alien vehicles. And I had seen it, but I hadn't fully looked into it. But I love, to me, the most interesting part was you responding going, absolutely insane and it was so before well, who, we even like what what publication was the article from it's, it's from the guardian it was from from the guardian, the guardian who's like a respected yes. like and, publication which yes. i think is why i was like oh shit <laughs> yeah and, like, and dude right. and so like i think before before we even jump into it i want to ask you how much did you look into it and what are you thinking now because i've i've gone on with my uh, tinfoil hat ramblings a few times on the show. And I'm just curious where your brain is at about everything. I mean, I think in general, as with most mm-hmm. things, if you can show me proof, I will believe it. And I will acknowledge it, its existence or acknowledge the reality of it. Um, I think that we <clears throat> aliens in general, <laughs> the universe yeah. is too big for us to be the only fucking living beings. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I I definitely, you know, probably believe that there's aliens in general. Um, but do I believe if we that we've come into contact with them or vice versa? I don't know. And so um I don't have to disclose all the information, but you and I had a conversation with a now friend of the pod yeah. a couple months <laughs> ago. Uh yeah. that I was like, Oh shit, there's like a lot of stuff that like we maybe don't yeah. know. Um yeah. and then the, and then obviously there's been <laughs> you know whistleblower reports or whatever they may be mm-hmm. um and then this new kind of like um uh diving into the the one of the more credible whistle whistleblower reports which i believe it is mm-hmm. um and, and yeah that article i didn't like dive super into it, but basically talking about this person that used to work for i don't know if it was like the department of defense or, or where he worked for and you could probably tell more but him like basically knowing that they had like spacecraft or whatever type of vehicles that were made out of something that we like couldn't explain i think yes yeah i don't know materials (laughs) that we just don't have yeah so okay um i mean we've had so i find this one really interesting and i i'm still not an expert on this guy or everything that happened by any means but I've, i've been looking into it a bit i haven't watched the like interview thing that he did but i've been reading a bit about him so his name is david grush i think is how you say it um I kind of keep forgetting, and it's an interesting last name, but David Grush, I think, is how how you say it. Uh, He's a former intelligence official who led analysis of unexplained uh, anomalous phenomenon, which I find 
so much more frustrating. They changed the UFO to UAP. Uh, unexplained mm-hmm. anomalous phenomenon just sounds like, mm-hmm. I don't know, a lot. It's a it's a mouthful. Well, it, but um, it's also like just wider ranging. It's not just flying. Sure. You know, which yes, you've no, said there's aliens in our oceans. So, I mean, there fucking are because they're fucking yeah. are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he was he was. Um, you know, a member of the U.S. Department of Defense Agency. Um, he is a very credible source. That's the thing. Is like one of the reasons that everybody's taking it so seriously is that he is he is a very credible source. Like everybody has been checking his credentials. It all checks out. He worked there, I think, for 14 years, 13 or 14 years, um, and he mm-hmm. has come out. But the the interesting thing to me is that it's a lot not, of the so. credibility, huh? Oh, haha. Sorry. Yeah, let's let's up. get it. Comments. Oh, with information about aliens. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the interesting thing to me with, with everybody taking this so seriously is that we have had incredibly credible whistleblowers. I would say more like we've had whistleblowers that, that were higher up in chains of, of command um, in, in every single country from, from military to science programs to, you know, people mm-hmm. that are, they they have more credentials than this guy for years mm-hmm. um, have been coming out. But it, I feel like news reports were still really hesitant to talk about it, the mm-hmm. more credible ones. But, you know, a couple of years ago when the Pentagon released all of the, the information and the classified stuff just about UFOs and UAPs in general, mm-hmm. I, it seems like news report, like news reporting things are more open to talk about this stuff, which has me. Sorry. So what let's look at what we know (laughs) let's look at what we know really quick the Uh pentagon came out and admitted a few years ago admitted said here we know for sure that ufos exist uaps exist there are things in the sky and in the ocean that we see on a pretty regular basis and we've seen them for decades and they didn't say this but without saying it they admitted that they had been hiding it for years Mm -hmm. that it was classified information and they now released it so we know that our government at least knew about things that were happening and kept it from us for a long time and actively denied it and whatever. That is simply a mm-hmm. fact. What that means, well, whether it's aliens, whatever, but that is a fact. That is an objective. It is just truth. So when you look at that, it just makes sense to me that they're still going, like they're going to choose the increments that they want to release that information and how they go about it. I feel like it's not going to continuously be as simple as you know i think that with something like this it's it makes sense to me the whole theory of like slowly introducing it to us just makes so much sense because it's how you stop people from panicking about it you get like enough people to basically believe that it's happening and then just slowly confirm it for them and i think part of that would be allowing you know more credible or even encouraging more credible news things to talk about it This guy, though, is interesting. David is interesting because his claims aren't even that he saw anything himself. Um, He he doesn't claim to have even seen photos, nonetheless, actual craft or bodies. He he started off by saying that we had alien craft um, Mm -hmm. like hidden uh, for the purpose of reengineering it uh, from crashes. But he has gone on since, like, once he kind of blew up online, he's gone on to say that, you know, well, naturally, with craft, there are, you know, bodies and things like that. Um, So I find him him interesting. All of his claims are basically him saying, I worked in this, you know, in the government for years, and I talked to all these people and interviewed is, is, you know, his word specifically, I interviewed all these people and have had countless people confirm these things to me and tell me them. So I kind of think it's interesting that he's the one blowing up when you have people that have at least claimed to have had more hands-on stuff again with higher credentials than him. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Um, I'm wondering if it's going to be like, I'm fully on the, on the government is lies to us and is going to lie to us. So I'm like, are they using this as a way to do the slow intro or are they going to have him make a big thing so that they can prove him wrong as a way of shutting it down and putting it back in the box, you know, or at least more like more in the box than they had it, you know, kind of killing, taking credibility from, I don't know. What what yeah, do you think? I don't do, think do anything's ever going to go back in the box. I don't know. I, I'm curious. You know how it's like something always happens around like the election cycle. Like it's always, sure. there's always yeah. something like, you know, not that COVID wasn't a thing, but um, 
you know, like that was obviously like twisted in many different ways during the election cycle. Um, sure. I'm wondering if this is like something that drops during the election cycle in November. Like, is it that time? they're just going to say it? I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know. See, I just, oh. I just wonder. That's where. That's where. I don't know. I don't know. It, they have me also, so confused. Like, I don't know how they're playing with their, all the shit. Right all now. the shit that's going on with Trump and like the stuff that he mm. knew, like knows, and like nuclear co- like all the shit mm-hmm. that he, like he's be- currently. You know, while we're recording this, being indicted on like thirty seven counts of like being a fucking idiot. I think it's thirty eight. Um, Just got to get that well, extra one listen, in there. Want to? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, if he had like boxes of uh, classified information around, I wonder if he knows anything about aliens. Did you see I mean, the right? pictures? Did you yeah, see the pictures? Fucking, of just do like... you know? Did you see this like story behind it? Like essentially, like I didn't see the full like, thing. He, it... he would keep his. <laughs> he would keep <laughs> the boxes with him. Like he would have his like his like body man or whatever, and like his like assistants like take the boxes from place to place as he went because he thought that they would like not be found to send like he wouldn't be caught if like the boxes were with him and so he basically was like uh there was like a lawyer coming and i don't oh fuck dude i can't fully remember what it was but basically like when they came to search mar-a-lago or like came to search whatever it was like he like left some around to make it look like oh shit like there were a couple of things but not like all these things and it turns out like yeah he had like and then they checked the footage and like saw like the video of like his his men like moving these massive like go, moving boxes onto planes while he's oh like traveling God. somewhere and like Listen. boxes and then that, that's where all these photos come from is like photos of you know boxes of um you know fucking classified information in a bathroom with a chandelier i do not <laughs> i do not that's understand cool. his logic i don't i don't get there's no logic like like you ain't never heard of a fucking a USB drive, a floppy disk. All right, you can you can have your dude scan whatever. I'm sure you're Trump. You got like a million different places that you reside. There's not one safe room where you could tuck them or have some construction done and build like a secret whatever. You're a fucking rich person. Batman, look what Jeez. Batman did. And you telling me that Trump doesn't have a single secret room and couldn't put the things on a floppy disk if he really wanted to have them at hand. I don't get it. He, he and his people <laughs> He's are a just fucking stupid. They're all stupid, so stupid. And that's all that it comes down to. Um, but, but yeah, I wonder if he knows anything. The aliens, he, man. Oh We're going to find out. We're going to find out I, soon, I'm sure. I What have I... What have I been saying for fucking years? What have I been saying for years? I used to say Mm -hmm. that I feel like I was like, I feel it in my bones that we're going to have official worldwide disclosure in our lifetime. And I was like, I feel good about that. Now, I think we're going to (laughs) have official worldwide disclosure within the next, I'm going to say for sure within the next 10 years, but I hope within the next like two to five if yeah. it happened this year, that would be sick. But I just want I just want it to happen so that I can be like, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna climb up on our roof. <laughs> I'm gonna stand out there. I'm gonna rip my shirt off. It's gonna be really intense. There's gonna be lightning going, and I'm gonna say, I fucking told you. <laughs> and it's gonna be great. I'm gonna be, what did I say? Do... Yeah, we need to do like a hyper cut of all the times that we've talked about aliens on the show. Cause it's been there's a few. A good amount. Yeah, I'm gonna start. Well, I'm gonna start wearing yeah. the tinfoil. I should have. I should have put on the tinfoil hat this episode. It's not even I'll a tinfoil hat up. anymore. It doesn't even. You know, it's just. A you hat don't know hat. that. That could be in the in the classified. Oh, I thought you were gonna say that it doesn't work, but no, it could I just work. meant. Oh. I don't know. Anyways, I'll put aliens. It, yeah, it's all good. Are basically real. This is us telling you aliens are real. Yeah. Get, just get ready. Essentially, oh, it's um, fun to hear you say that. I gotta tell it's, you, it's, seeing you say that, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like a given yeah. now. I think uh, uh, a- aliens <laughs> being, you know, something unknown that we have never experienced before. That is sure, whether it's from living in the fucking mantle of the Earth or <laughs> coming from another planet or you know right, whatever right. is happening. Oh. Uh, in other news, just one thing I wanted to mention really quick before we get to the interview, because sure. I thought that you would enjoy this. Um, a couple days ago, chatting with uh, Empire, the the publication Empire, Michael mm-hmm. Keaton, who is uh, obviously reprising his role of Beetlejuice. You want to uh, get told, nuts? 
<laughs> that's Batman. But he he told oh, Empire yeah. that uh, we're doing it exactly like we did the first movie. There's a woman in the great waiting room for the afterlife, literally with a fishing line. I want people to know this because I love it. Tugging on the tail of a cat to make it move. He says, Good. making stuff up, making stuff happen, improvising and riffing, but literally handmade stuff like people creating things with their hands and building something. It's fucking great. It's the most fun I've had working on a movie, and I can't tell you how long. So, obviously, that's very refreshing to hear. Yeah, It's one of the huge, like, worries that we had going into yeah. Beetlejuice 2, or Beetletooth, if you will. Um, <laughs> I'm still kind of worried about, like, the premise. I don't really know what it's going to be. Um, and I also am worried that we're kind of still throwing... I love Jenna Ortega, but like mm -hmm. she can't just be every fucking goth girl in you know what I mean in like everything now. Like she sure I, I just feel like you're gonna have this one like actress just embodying all these roles and it's gonna feel like she's playing the same thing. Like her I'm worried her Wednesday's gonna feel too much like her, like Lydia's daughter, if that makes sense. Sure. Um Yeah. And who knows, maybe um, maybe it's a huge twist and like Lydia's daughter is actually like sunshine Gosh. and rainbows like that yeah. you know what i mean like maybe that's the whole thing right so um yeah i hope i'm wrong i'm just like that i'm worried about that i also know willem defoe's on the cast justin thoreau's on the cast um obviously danny elfman who just celebrated his 70th birthday uh he's is gonna jacked. be doing he is he's Have fucking ripped, him? dude he's yeah, fucking he's jacked ripped. dude he's, he's joked up <laughs> he's been doing his um, push-ups and eating his wheaties guys you go look at a picture of danny elfman Yikes. uh yeah he's obviously going to be doing the the score so i just wanted to mention that because I, I i read that article and, and thought that that was uh very exciting obviously yeah yeah um yeah, that definitely makes me happy. I feel like no matter what, I, I'll still have my like bits and pieces. I hope I hope not. Um, but hearing that yeah. makes me feel a lot better about it. As for Jenna, um, I know what you mean. I do think like when you just look at the singular role, I think that she would be good for it. Um, but unfortunately, yeah. that's just not how she's our brains great. work. You know, uh, the people that are going to see this saw Wednesday and have probably seen other things that she's in and have seen her rise i guess you know she's yeah. she's been booming lately and um and i think that you're right it it might it might just be a bit too much too soon um but i don't yeah. know i i don't want to i'm gonna try my best to like push that out of my head because and just focus on the role you know because i i do think that she is a good lydia's daughter uh, or could potentially yeah. be so yeah we'll see i agree um on that note we will get you guys over to our interview this week with Zichun and Brendan Hay um, from the new Max series, Gremlins, Secrets of the Mogwai. Again, prequel series talking about the origin of the Mogwai. Um, we won't really spoil too much. You guys should watch it because it's a fun watch. Family-friendly watch if you want to bring in your your nieces, your nephews, your brethren, your sister in, uh, all that good stuff. Um Sean, any final thoughts before we go to the interview? Yeah. So you said family friendly watch. Uh, it is, but also they, they do. I say this in the interview. They are, they don't step too, too far away from the, the types of gags and, and the gore and the creepiness uh, of the movies. Um, it is a bit toned down for sure. I would say it's a stepping stone to the movies. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, both these guys had such such great things to say. It was awesome to talk to them. And in general, I know that we talked about the show when we first heard it being announced. And I want to say that I like it a lot more than I I thought I was going to like yeah. it. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, so I really enjoyed this conversation. And I think you guys should give the show a watch and then you're going to dig the conversation, too. Yep. On that note, we'll get you guys over to our conversation with Z Chun and Brendan Hay from Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai. We'll catch you guys on the other side. All right, we are joined today by Zi Chun and Brendan. Hey, Zi and Brendan are both at the helm of the new Max series, Gremlins, Secrets of the Mogwai, where Zi is a showrunner and executive producer, and Brendan is writer and executive producer. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show today. So stoked thank to you have for having you. us. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, we have to talk about something. Uh, during doing our research, uh, before we jump into any Gremlins at all, you guys both seem like comic book nerds. Is that fair assumption? I mean, like, 
you know, there's there's a lot of comic <laughs> books history in, in both of your lives. One hundred percent on my case. I don't don't want to speak for Z, but yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I always wanted to be a comic book artist. That was how mm-hmm. I started into writing. Um, I mm-hmm. drew a lot of comics in lower school, and then at some point, uh, I was like, well, wow, somebody's got to write the words that are going to go in these speech balloons. <laughs> And yeah. that's how I started writing. And now, um, about five years ago, we launched a comic book company called TKO Presents. And uh, we publish books by some of the top authors in the business. Um, uh, writers like Garth Ennis, uh, who did The Boys, Jeff Lemire, who did Sweet Tooth, Roxanne Gay, um, and some really incredible artists as well, um, like Maine Doyle, who did The Kitchen, Steve Epting, who did Captain America Winter Soldier, um, uh, there are a Gabriel Walta who did the vision. So we, we've got mm-hmm. like some, some really fun books um, from really, really cool creators. Yeah. Oh, I books. was peeking through your, your guys's website earlier and saw in your thriller horror section, there was this one with this big demon on it. I'm trying to find it now. Black mass rising. And it really caught yeah. my attention. And I, uh, I might have to check that book out. Um, yeah. Black mass rising before. is amazing. It's by yeah. Theo Presidus and, Jody Muir and Jody is a classic, a classically trained painter, and um, every panel of the book is is beautifully painted. Looks like it. Yeah. That's always. Uh, um... Oh, sorry, Steve. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll let you no, go. you're you're good. What were you saying? Sean? I was just going to say it's it's always. I get a little frustrated. I'm I I very much so enjoy comics. I'm not um, a historian by any any means, but. <laughs> one of the things that kind of frustrates me is when a, a comic has an amazing, like beautiful cover. And then I kind of get in and, uh, and I totally understand <laughs> it. Like paneling is, yeah. is hard, but there's just a couple times where I find the covers to be a little bit misleading, but that's the same with the horror genre VHS and stuff like that. I was about but, to uh, say the exact thing. It's the VHS box uh, syndrome. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, looking at this, I, I got to peek in? through some of the panels and it looks, it looks beautiful all the way through. So I have to check. Yeah. It out. We try to, we try to always have, um, the interior artist do the cover uh yeah kind of to avoid the thing that you're talking about where it's like <laughs> sure oh yeah. <laughs> here's a cover with some real some characters that i really like and then you go inside and you're like that art is completely different not even the characters look the same <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i so the reason that i brought up the the comic yeah. book nerdiness Please. is uh as two people that are, I, I, I'll speak in past tense, who, who have adapted a beloved series and, and put it onto uh, now Max, an animated form, um, you know, you've, you've been a part of a, of a reboot, right? Or at least a reimagining. Um, that's happening ad nauseum in the comic book space, specifically with like <laughs> Marvel and, and DC. Um, and obviously, you know, you guys are both in the industry, so you don't have to like speak fully to anything like about uh, Marvel or DC. But I'm really curious, like what your guys' thoughts are on um, superhero fatigue kind of in general. Like, I mean, I, I personally just saw Spider-Verse last night, which was mm-hmm. phenomenal. Uh, but also there were four superhero trailers before it. So I'm I'm really <laughs> curious if you guys have any thoughts on that or at least like what the what the limit should be if there is one. I I'm happy to jump to that. So, yeah. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, go feel free. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, cause no. Uh, jump on the sword for us. <laughs> I will take as you say, I'll take the first bullet and then you can you can stand over my corpse. It'll be great. Um No, I mean it's the weird thing. Until the last two superhero movies I saw, I was definitely getting burned out on myself. Like on the comic side, I find I go through my fits and spurts. Like I go through like two years of like, you know what? I just need to read anything that's not superhero. Like give me the horror comics, the comedy comics, the crime comics. Give me all of that. Uh, and then literally like I'll stumble on something like I got really into. Um, I want to say the writer's name is Jeremy Adams. And I'm unfortunately blanking on the artist who's currently on Flash. And is one of those like I stumbled upon an issue in the store flip through it and have been like picking up the entire run now because it's like oh this totally is taps back into a version of a character i like telling me what feels like a new take on that character right so i'm like oh i forgot i can love this again and it's like after two years of probably not reading a superhero book i'm kind of back on board and i feel like i'm hitting that now for movies also it felt like the burned out and then guardians 3 i found much more moving than i expected and spider verse just completely floored me and i was like tearing up in the first 20 minutes like three times so Mm -hmm. it just goes to show it's it's the i try to always remember it's the individual like film or comic and not the broader thing 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I feel like as somebody who grew up reading comics and just always wanted comics to have a wider audience, that mm -hmm. I still, I still, I drive down the street and I see ads for comic book movies and comic book TV shows, and I'm like, I can't believe that I lived long enough for this stuff to become cool and to be like the <laughs> dominant thing that's in the theaters now. And so I'm still kind of riding high on on things like that, but. At the same time, you know, when we started TKO Studios, um, you know, me and my co-founder, Sal Simeon, you know, one of the things we wanted to make sure was that um, it was going to be really inclusive and that you didn't necessarily need to have an understanding of 60, 70 years of continuity. Or, you know, even if you're jumping in in some reboot of the entire line, it still requires like a certain amount of um, context and understanding for those characters. And even as a huge comic book nerd, like there are times where I'll pick up a comic book and be like, who the hell is that guy? I've never seen that guy. Before. Right. I don't think I've seen that guy. Is that the same guy in a different costume? Is it the same costume, but a different guy inside of it? Um, but it was really important to us that um, at TKO Studios, you know, we, we don't do any superhero books because that market is really well served by Marvel and DC. Sure. And just yeah. wanting people to be able to jump in and just experience a, a story in graphic novel format. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's. I feel like there's a, a lot of people that just immediately associate comics with superhero stories, which are are perfectly relevant and and amazing and deserving. But uh, a lot of the the graphic graphic novels and stuff I read are are different, which is why peaking that uh that that demon one. I can't. I already the name has already left me. But black the black mass rising. Yes, yeah. there you copy go. today. Uh, TKO presents. Yeah. .com. There you go. <laughs> right after the interview. Um, but so I, I want to ask. Um, one of our, our favorite questions to ask every guest that we bring on the show is your, I'm, we're curious about your intros to the genre, intros to the horror space. We, we know that you've loved mm -hmm. comics uh, all of your lives, it seems, uh, but I'm mm -hmm. curious where horror came into play. We're looking for those moments where you peek from behind the couch and you see something that you weren't supposed <laughs> to see at a young age. Uh, if you guys could take turns sharing, sharing any memories sure. like that with us. Um, I'll jump in because I have a really crystal clear one. Um, mm -hmm. So outside of Gremlins, which I saw younger than I should have with older cousins and absolutely was that like, this terrified me, but I also want to now read every storybook and have my own gizmo. And like, I want to keep going back to it, but I'm scared. The other one though, very specifically was seeing on a friend at a friend's house because his older brother was watching uh, part of the omen and specifically the sequence where spoiler for the omen, uh, David Warner gets decapitated by glass. Yeah. Like it was one of those oh, like yeah. nightmare sequences that just like I saw it when I was probably about like first or second grade and it like I had utter nightmares. It like I remembered it perfectly like it just stayed in my brain so perfectly to the thing where I'm like I didn't know what the movie was at the time. I'm just like all I know is I walked into a room and saw a man get decapitated by a plane, pane of glass and I couldn't <laughs> like shake it. And it wasn't until like I was probably like a teenager or so and happened to watch the movie. I'm like this is it. This is the thing. Yes. But um it stayed with me and I kept having a lot of those moments growing up. And then the thing that like turned me though, to actually like actively watching it versus like I'm repelled, but want more was tales from the crypt. Um, nice. Seeing that okay. on HBO, which I mean, be honest is, you know, probably as like a preteen, it was probably the promise of lurid materials on top of the horror that got me to initially watch. Uh, but sure. then as it was going, I'm like, Oh my God, this is so much fun. Like I just give me every episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Omen's such a great one that the the it's all for you, Damien. Uh, I've never seen <laughs> God, that. Yeah, really young. it's it's filled <laughs> yeah. with moments that are just really frightening. Not great for, for kids. Uh, for yeah, kids no, yeah, but they stay with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent iconic. See, what about you? I mean, I think for me, a lot of the horror movies I grew up watching were horror comedies from Hong Kong. It's its own mm -hmm. genre there that, um, and a, a couple of the. Uh, the creatures and spirits and monsters show up in gremlins. Yep. So there's one um, whole genre of Hong Kong horror comedy that have to do with the Jiang Shi, which are kind of like hopping vampires. <laughs> and they're all in bureaucratic dress from is it, the Ming dynasty or something like that. I, I can't so. remember yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> we, I swear we did the research. Um, we did. <laughs> and and um, as a kid, I just remember being like, some of my favorite stars are in these movies, but it, they're really mm -hmm. scary, even though they're also really funny. And I remember when I watched Gremlins for the first time, also too young. I think that is the <laughs> that is the pattern from everybody who worked on the show was they watched the show the, the movie too young. Um, 
even though I hadn't seen an American film that had that comedy horror element to it, um, I kind of recognized that feeling from watching the Hong Kong movies that I did growing mm. up. And throughout college and then after college, um, I had a, a my best friend, um, Sal Simeone, um, who was the son. He has the same name, but he's the son of um, my business partner. Um, he was a huge horror buff. And I got exposed to a lot of like really great horror movies. I remember staying up and watching like, you know, Zack Snyder's like Dawn of the Dead and then going back and watching all yeah. the George Romero movies. Mm -hmm. And I think what I really loved about what I love still about the horror genre is because so much of it has to do with creating a feeling in the audience and you can't really do that with dialogue. You can sometimes dialogue can be additive, but it's one of the most like pure cinema genres because you have to move the camera in a certain way. You sound design and the staging and everything like it, it's a, uh, it's just incredible when it all comes together. And I think that that's like a, that's a really cool thing in horror that you don't necessarily get from other genres. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it something, yeah. Is it something that you guys were, I mean, there's, there's aspects of, I mean, we obviously, there's so many different things of your gremlin series that we want to talk about, but the horror aspect, I guess, not bearing the lead of our show, but is that something that you guys were consistently trying to tap into during the course of creation? Cause there's, I mean, there's moments in the series that are dark, you know, like there's, there's moments of the original series of uh, the original film specifically that we can talk about in like dialogue that is insanely dark and should not be in a PG movie. But <laughs> I, I'm curious, the line that I, there's, I, we can hit that <laughs> later, but there's some, um, some things in the new series. I'm curious, like the line that you guys were trying to toe with horror, if that was like a conscious thing mm -hmm. in the back of your minds. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. a lot of this goes back to the original pitch where, mm -hmm. you know, we knew we wanted to do a, kind of like a new take on like an 80s Amblin movie, which, you know, things like Goonies and obviously Gremlins, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, they're within all these genres, but they're also, they have a horror element and like a fear element to them. And looking back on it, you know, one of the things that we we're really happy about is, Early on in the pitch, it was always that we wanted to capture the original tone of Gremlins, but, you know, in a new genre with new characters, except for Gizmo. And obviously Sam Wing is very different in the, in the movies, uh, <laughs> 70 years older. Um, but really wanting to hit the horror comedy aspects of it. And what we found was when you're in the writer's room day after day, and you're talking about these scenes and these moments and jump scares and, you know, gags and things that are funny, you know, one of the things that Brendan and I really um, tried to talk about a lot in the writer's room was let's try to push the horror as far as we can push it. Let's ha have the comedy push as hard as we can push it, but also the way that those two talk to each other can make things both safer and then also sometimes more scary and more dangerous because you can lull people into a certain sense of like complacency with humor and then you can undercut it with something really scary. And then you can actually push the horror uh, scarier um, if uh, if there's a comedy element to it as well, I mean, one thing that we talked about yeah. in the room was there's a, a like I kind of had forgotten it until I watched it again, but like a recurring gag where one of the gremlins uh, bites off somebody's finger and uses that cigar and then eventually like eats it, and like yes, it's disgusting. It's so gross, <laughs> and and if you saw that, I mean, it's 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 very like it's very scary, but at the same time because it's gremlins there, it can be funny. And we were able to push the horror further because of that. Yeah. Sure. I think that really yeah. was the nice thing is in both, sorry, uh, for both horror and comedy, you're always writing to reaction. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, it is weirdly in the end. I always feel like it's the same thing. It's that same sense of like, if you're writing a comedy, it's like, okay, is this the funniest version of the scene? If not, how can we go back and add more? And it's like, at least in my experience, whenever I've tried to write horror stuff, it's the same thing. It's like, is this the most tense or trying to find that variety of like, all right, we have a jump scare here, but is the rest of this feeling, is there a way to make this darker? Is there a way to kind of just increase the tension? So you, you're always writing to reaction versus just like, oh, I just want to put this out there. Definitely. Yeah, and I, absolutely. I think it speaks to like the marriage of those two genres. You know, we've we've had a lot of comedians on this, like we've talked mm -hmm. to you know, like Josh Rubin is, I think, a great example oh, of yeah. someone who's like That's directed great. these comedy horror films, um, is also a comedian kind of on in his own right. But I mean, a lot of people, even like horror musicals, um, I think of the guy who wrote Evil Dead, the musical is kind of like a stand up, mm. you know, George Rybla is like a stand up comedian, but also is a fan of horror. So they have these wonderful marriage. Um, 
Z, I'm curious, you were talking about the original pitch of this, like working with Amblin, which like I'm sure your guys' names next to Spielberg's like in the series is probably like an amazing thing. I, I can't even imagine <laughs> real, that yeah. going on. <laughs> um, but uh, what was that initial pitch like? Like this is something, you know, Gremlins just celebrated its what? 30th, 39th, 40th? I think. Yeah. 39th. Yeah. 39th. Yeah. 39th yeah. anniversary a couple days ago as of re- we're recording mm-hmm. this or yesterday as we're recording this. Um, so obviously a series that hasn't been touched in a little while. Um, what was the original like pitch? Like kind of how did that start off? Um, whoever wants to take that. Yeah. I mean, so I didn't, what I didn't realize, so Brandon has a, has a long history of working in animation and this is my first mm-hmm. animated show, which is a hundred percent why they put Brendan on this show. Because <laughs> I did, did not a hundred percent know what I was doing early on. I'm still only at 70%. Um, but I feel like, you know, what I really loved about the process of pitching on the show and, and, this is going to get a little inside baseball, but I also kind of feel like sure. I always try to be very like honest about this stuff because it always yeah. looks so opaque from the outside. And it's kind of fun to like show people that it's like, it's not, ex- it's not, it's not as glamorous as everyone thinks it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's also like at the end of the day, it was just something where Amblin and Warner brothers, um, they knew they wanted to do a animated reboot of gremlins set in 1920s, China. And they told me to come in with uh, not even a pitch. They were just like, come in and have a conversation, which is also the scariest thing. We were like, okay, well, I have no safety net. I'm just going to come in and talk for like an hour. Sure. We'll see. Right. And uh, I went and talked to them. Um, our execs were Audrey Deal and, um, and Clint Levine, who are fantastic. And um, I basically just talked about how much I love the original, those old Amblin movies that were kind of like kids stuck in like life or death situations, things mm-hmm. like Goonies and Gremlins and the sense of wonderment and like epic adventure that I really loved about those movies, things like Raiders of the Lost Ark, how cinematic they were and mm-hmm. wanting to bring a very kind of serialized emotional storytelling to the Gremlins franchise. And you know, I think when you hear like Gremlins cartoon, you're not sure what it really means, but you know, we wanted to do a big epic adventure that was uh, something that anybody could kind of come in and watch. Um, I talked a lot about uh, the spirits and creatures of Chinese mythology, uh, things that I grew up with. And I, I also talked a lot about um, there, there's, <laughs> there's a theme park in Hong Kong and Singapore called Hapa Villa. Um, and Hapa Villa is basically like Universal Studios, except for Chinese mythology. And it is incredibly dark. Like, whereas like you can go to Universal Studios and drink like butter beer, like Hapa Villa was you go in and they're like, all right, kid, walk through the 12 courts of hell. And you're going to watch people yes. being sawed in half <laughs> yes. upside down, like bone tomahawk style. Yes. And I remember being like a seven year old and being like, this is so intense. And there's like, you know, even when the picnic area, you're sitting on a crab with a human head. And I was like, what is happening here? And I wanted to bring that weirdness to the Gremlins franchise because like, you know, Mogwai have the rules. They're scary, but they're also really funny. And that tone, I thought, mixed really well with uh, Chinese spirits and monsters. So I talked for like an hour and they're like, okay. And they're like, put together like four pages on it. And then later on... um, we ended up um, pitching Amblin and then eventually Spielberg. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of like, I was trying to, I would try to play it cool, but I wasn't, I mean, I almost like blacked out during the Amblin pitch and <laughs> Brendan and I had to go pitch. Uh, we, we, when we pitched Spielberg, we didn't have to pitch him. We would, we were very happy yeah. to pitch him. Oh, um, God, yeah. And he was so nice. He was just like very yeah. supportive. And um, it was definitely like a dream, a dream come true. And oh, yeah. to have, oh yeah. You know, to to be able to work with Brendan and our supervising producer Dan Crawl to put together the artwork. Like, there were a few people here from day one, and I'm I'm just really happy that like the original vision of the show that all of us were worked together on. I, I feel like that that eventually became the show, which is not always the case. As, as you yeah. Said. <laughs> yeah, it's great to Absolutely. have that final I- like acceptance of what you've created is 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 what you wanted to create yeah. too. That's, mm-hmm. that's wonderful to hear. 
I also have to say that Hupa Villa is now a bucket list location for me. Absolutely, um, <laughs> absolutely yeah. have to go. I I had a panic attack on the Peter Pan flight when I was like six or seven, and you're telling me that you you went here. I have a horror podcast now. It's like, oh man, yeah, have to go. Um, so uh, so so Brendan, I'm I'm curious. Uh, as he just said, you know, you were brought in for the animation side. I'm mm-hmm. curious if you could talk at all about, like, I, I know that you've worked on a handful of shows. We saw like 13 episodes of Robot Chicken, which is great. I'm curious oh, yeah. if you could Love talk Chicken. a little bit <laughs> about uh, about what, you know, the knowledge and things that you were able to bring to the show. And as well as uh, talk about animation as a genre and especially uh, in a genre that maybe can make a, adult content, too um mm-hmm. today i think that that's something a conversation that's kind of being had in the industry del toro had some great things to say about that oh yeah pinocchio so i'm just curious of your thoughts on uh on the medium because sure, not a absolutely. genre it's a medium yeah, yeah. I, thank you for beating me <laughs> yes. to the first sentence yeah i know yeah. uh, much appreciated <laughs> yeah um but yeah going back to yeah for team up with z i mean he had he blew me away in our very first meeting just by like the stuff that you guys are now in like those first few episodes, like the fourth rule and all that kind of stuff. I was like, Oh my God, this is like, as a gremlins fan, this is the show I would want to see. So Mm -hmm. I was just totally thrilled with Z's take and so happy to kind of get on board. And I mean, honestly, a lot of the animation part was just the, the ever so slightest things of what was possible versus live action and a lot of times thankfully it was the no we can actually kind of go bigger we can kind of do a little more unless it involves water uh water or fur (laughs) then it was try not to do any which is by the way great restrictions on mogwai uh right (laughs) um but no i mean honestly yeah it really just became kind of the fun of collaboration and both of us just always plusing each other's scripts so it really it's a very fun and easy marriage on that part um for animation in general i mean i think that is the great thing it's it feels like a wider audience is accepting that animation can be anything i think that's always the beauty of it um it's the same thing i because i got into this originally of like i loved comedy and i loved comic books and that's how i eventually got to animation um the same thing i love about comics is possible animation which is people will go with weird so much quicker in those mediums it's it doesn't have to have that whole like well it needs a grounded element it's like you can have a heightened world you can have just weird surreal moments and it's just more generally accepted um and it's Mm -hmm. also i think animation is something where um tones can shift a lot quicker like kind of again it's people get a little bit more whiplash in live action sometimes from comedy pressed up against horror pressed up against action or heartfelt drama Versus in animation, it's like a lot of them it is. No, all these things can happen. All can go together. It's really just you find the right artists and execute it with them. It's all going to flow because there's always a kind of little bit of like a dreamlike quality to any animated projects. It's always detached from reality, reality. So, yeah, yeah, it's something that I've always been a fan of. It's something I've always been trying to chase and want to do in my own work. Um, And it's nice to see something like Spider-Verse having such a huge reception in terms of both audience and critics because it's like, yeah, this is always impossible. Or Guillermo's Pinocchio, uh, which, you know, totally floored me also. It's things like that. It's like, yeah. there's so much that can be done here. That's It's great that it's great. That there's so much animation for kids, but there can also be animation in every possible genre and for every possible age. Yes, it's that's uh, I went to school for for animation. And one of the things I uh, bring up on the show a lot, I'm, I'm a big fan of horror for kids. I really love that juxtaposition mm-hmm, just in general. But then also. Uh, horror in animation that is 100% not for kids. I want to see more mm-hmm. of that. You know, um, it's just just like you just said, people are more willing to be um, to get weird in those spaces, I think. Uh, and so it's yeah, yeah I would love to yeah. see that. I also um, will I say do... like, uh, obviously, like the IP is a reason for it. But the two biggest openings of the year so far are animated films, you know, like that and yeah. Super Mario Brothers, which yeah. again, IP related probably. Yeah. But, um, but before we jump from animation, I'm I'm curious, you know, Brendan, we were talking about uh, the strike before we actually started recording. Mm-hmm. You know, I think animation <laughs> is like an interesting aspect of that, too, because like, you know, there's there's the writers rooms and then there's the animation writers rooms or the animation rooms, or the, which are mm-hmm. even different and more removed. I'm curious if you have any specific thoughts on that being in those spaces. Um, it's animation's a weird thing just in relation to that, because like probably 80% of animation jobs, maybe it could honestly be more like 90% of animation jobs are covered by a totally different union. There's the animation guild, which right. our show was produced under. Um, they're a great union. They're actually incredibly supportive, but it doesn't represent solely writers. It's also artists, directors. It, it's a 
it's different priorities. Um, right. In a perfect world, it would be amazing to have all writers in one union together. And also for folks like myself who are in both and have jumped back and forth between both for years, it's really frustrating. It's like my cumulative years and pensions and stuff like that someday are going to be on separate tracks. So um, it's not the issue for today. I think we have bigger concerns, especially yeah. when you look to like, WGA has so many completely valid concerns that apply to all of us in Animation Guild and in every possible union. So it's like, this is the fight for now. It would be great to see down the road. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of good work in the last few years, by the way. I think both unions, there used to be some more friction. I think that's going away. But just to keep going mm -hmm. down the road of after the strike is settled, once we kill AI once and forever, get rid of Skynet, for them to actually just start to actually find other ways to come together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah apply ai to the to the right things not exactly not these things yeah, yeah make make people's <laughs> lives easier not uh yes just rich people's lives easier um <laughs> i do want to ask so we're talking a little bit about animation i want to talk a little bit about puppetry uh which is a mm -hmm. form of animation you know a huge aspect of the original films that you know that brought people in and, and gives it its charm is the puppetry in those movies uh and i know that i was like whoa they're doing an animated gremlins when i heard about it so i'm curious if you guys could speak to anyone that might be hesitant to jump into this show for that that uh you know those differences like what what does this show bring and how does it kind of match with that yeah i mean i think so <clears throat> We were very lucky on the show that um, Joe Dante came on as a consulting yes. producer early on. And I think we had a couple scripts finished at that point. Um, so we had something to send him. I think we had some artwork as well. Yeah. And it was just really fun to have him come in and talk to the creative team and talk about um, what it was like producing uh, those live action movies. Um, one of the things I think he was really excited about with having it be animated was you can kind of do certain things um, that you can't with puppets, like um, mm -hmm. Gizmo can walk, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we can kind of have him moving in a different way. Um, but it was really important for us to really honor the look of the original Gremlins. And so one of the first things that we did was we got to go to the Warner Brothers archive and they have like some really beautifully preserved. First off, they have, it's like a nerd paradise. Like they have every Batmobile. <laughs> they have like <laughs> costumes from like, I think like Gone with the Wind, like just like incredible yeah. history. Jesus. And um, one of the things we did was we just pulled up the, the Gremlins puppets and took photos of them, looked at the skin texture. And, um, you know, I think that there's, there's always a trade-off, obviously. Um, something like a puppet, which is so real world in a real world environment. I mean, I think that's, one of the reasons why gremlins worked so well whereas like you yeah. know some of the clones and the spin-offs and the copycats like the puppets were like let's just be generous and say not as good as yeah. gremlins were <laughs> yeah, sure. and um i think there's a reason why just from the character design standpoint you know the the mogwai character design has really persevered over these years and people still like really lock into it um but for us you know we we really wanted to tell a huge epic story you know every episode takes place in a different location there's a a large cast um there are times where there's you know like dozens and dozens of gremlins evil mogwai on screen at one time and we just kind of knew early on that if we were going to do that it has to be it has to be animated and you know, to, sh to shoot this show in <laughs> what looks like 1920s china right now I think that budget would have been relatively large. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. No, uh, would yeah. have been tough. No, that's uh, been tough. hundred yeah. percent fair. <laughs> the one other thing I was going to say to the puppetry side, especially for anybody who's like, "Oh, but I miss the puppets," and which I get, but um, we also actually allowed that to inform some of our animation choices, especially actually in the horror moments. We always is our way almost around S and P issues at time, which, by the way, thankfully we were very supported on. But we would use the logic of how would they have done this as a practical effect? And that actually leads to some of the things that worked out best. Like um, in the second episode, when Green reveals what he can do with his jaw, it was almost going for like, what is the stop motion puppet version of this? Like, what would that look like? Or we have yeah. um, some limb loss later in the season. And we reference like mm -hmm. in our mind is like, well, let's watch again how they did the science teacher in the original film. Yes. And it was that same kind of thing, like that mixture of like puppetry and practical effects. So it's like we, that actually helped inform our language in our show. Sure. I could see it um, specifically in 
so I we've had the I'm, I'm not going to spoil anything, but yeah. we have had the privilege. I, I've seen the whole show. Um, I've gotten to see to see every episode so far. And in some of the gremlin demises, uh, a mm -hmm. I was very pleasantly surprised to see that you didn't pull your punches. You know, it it has a very uh, you know uh, like the the art is is beautiful, and but it was leaning. Um, very cutesy you know uh mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. i i wasn't sure you guys were gonna go there and you did uh but in some <laughs> of the gremlin deaths specifically the way that it kind of melts in and bubbles and stuff like that <laughs> i was like okay they were they were paying attention and and nailed it uh Good. i appreciated the uh Oh, I don't want to spoil. I'm trying to like compliment you without spoiling anything. <laughs> deaths. I'm going to say there's some deaths that I really, really Thank enjoyed. <laughs> yes. We're proud of the yeah, deaths. I can see the influence. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Really big. Deal. I, um, you, you mentioned working with Joe Dante, which is obviously something that we wanted to talk about. Joe has phenomenal films, obviously gremlins being yeah. one of them, um, as well as the burbs, which I feel like is uh, oh, very yeah. underrated and more people need to watch. But, um, I'm curious if there were any specific insights that he were he was able to provide. I know, you know, obviously consulting with him in general, I'm sure was very um, was very helpful. Uh, but I wonder if there was a thing or two that he gave you that you really, you know, really stuck with you. Um, and outside of by um, Christopher Columbus, uh, not the not the um, sailor, but the, the that were you. You know, this was directed by Joe, but written a writer, <laughs> writer, director, producer. Um, did you guys have any consultation with him? I didn't see it, but I was just curious to ask. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of Joe, you know, we were one of the things he told us early on, because it is funny. It's like as a fan, I mean, as Brandon and I, as fans of the movie, we have like our ideas of why Gizmo was so adorable and lovable and why he's persevered for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Joe told us early on, he was like, um, people love Gizmo because he's a furry baby. He's just a furry baby. He does like baby things, can't really communicate, and you want to take care of him. And it was just the kind of how succinct it was when he brought that up. Mm -hmm. It was a good reminder for us in terms of like, mm -hmm. what is the thing that people have connected with? And, you know, he spent the last, at this point, you know, 39 years thinking about, you know, why Gizmo is you know one of his most you know persevering characters yeah. um and you know in terms of uh chris columbus you know we we didn't really have a lot of contact with him we were mainly dealing with amblin and warner brothers and mm -hmm. joe and, and spielberg yeah got you and um, i will say the one other thing from joe uh similarly he also gave us a great tip for almost like rule for comedy with uh the evil mogwai which was um, whenever in doubt, just have them act like people. And that was kind of like the, you can never go wrong with a gag or with anything that, yeah, the gold that he had found. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, a very, a very obvious thing that they do in the original films, which, which makes yeah. them like, you know, the fact that they're a reflection of humanity is, uh, what makes them evil. I don't know if that's a great yeah. uh, thing that I want to <laughs> yeah. come, come to like, sure. you know, accept, but, uh, it just has to be, I'm. One of the things yeah. from the original film, you know, so there's darkness, right? Like there's obviously some some dark stuff. I mean, there's literally a line um, that the that I can't remember what her name is, but um, the love interest says, I mean, she's like during Christmas when some people are opening their gifts, <laughs> others are opening their wrists. And that's not a thing you could probably say in a PG movie. Um, but there's other things like there's a lot of like nationalism in the film, which I didn't realize the last time I watched it until recently. <laughs> um and I'm curious, I mean, like, obviously, you know, a, a film set in small town America, um, obviously set in New York in the second one, but then going to 1920s China, like you, the the films feel so, or the, the um, I'll, I'll call them films, but the film to the series feels so different because you have this original film that has this like pretty blatant American nationalism in it. And then you have your series now that is so, I mean, you have, you know, uh, voice actors that are you know it's not white people voicing um you know people of chinese heritage like you you have actors and actresses that are of chinese heritage voicing these characters um you have you know very sp like period accuracy things and all of the um all the episodes that you're putting out so i'm curious if you have any thoughts on the nationalism in the first um film compared to like how accurate you're trying to be or, and and you are in the new series mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, I mean, for me, and, and you know, I don't want to speak for both of us, but to me, 
there is such a joy that Joe takes in not just presenting the Americana, but then destroying it <laughs> that yeah. I always yeah. love that. It was kind of that to me always under even the person who's kind of very anti foreign in the movie certainly mm-hmm. gets his one up come up. It's, and yeah. so I think it's like um, when I was watching, it, I remember like, really loving the kind of Americana backdrop of it. I mean, there's something that's so fun about setting a totally. a movie in that kind of suburban landscape. Um, but then watching it get destroyed, it's kind of like, I mean, it's like a comedic horror version of like, um, yeah. you know, the Dean Devlin movies from the nineties where it was like, <laughs> yes, American values, but we destroy the entire country. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, and but I, Joe yeah. is so he's, he's such an, like a, lovable anarchist in a lot of ways a um great description. <laughs> and for for me like you know i i know that we there's it's a little bit of a it's a needle to thread in terms of the mr wing from the original movies um being kind of a you know presented maybe in like a wise orient orientalist way but at the same time when i was a kid you know the characters like Data and Short Round and Mr. Wing, to me, like seeing any representation on screen, especially like when they're like a positive force in the movie itself, was yeah. really meaningful to me. And so sure. um, I remember watching the original Gremlins movies and being, you know, he's not in a lot of the movie. He's in the, like the first scene and the, like the second to last scene. Yeah. And, um, but I still really locked into him because I was like, wow, there's like a Chinese character that like starts the movie and ends the movie. Like, mm-hmm. I wonder what his deal is. And it right. turns out the way I found out was pitching a whole show and writing two seasons oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, also he's the one, he's the, the one that can control this crazy situation that we just saw unleash. Mm-hmm. You know, we like, he, he's clearly at this powerful figure. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious. I, I have to figure out how to wear this cause it's kind of all over the place and it wasn't exactly prepped, but I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, Mogwai are such an interesting, uh, character just culturally i think to me because they're this fusion of like british you know world war ii pilot folklore and then now well i mean since the movies um you know with with chinese culture so i'm curious if you can talk at all about that fusion and and what your thought process is on maybe like the blending of those two things does that make sense i'm i just think it's so interesting that it's yeah it it does i mean i think you know, one of the it, it, it's it's a really interesting question, and it's one that I don't necessarily have like a one part answer to. Um, sure, I think that one of the things that we loved about the show was just m- loved about the Mogwai, um, whether it's the original movies or what we were able, we we tried to do with them in the show, was that they kind of just facilitate the destruction of systems of being for humans, um, whether mm-hmm. that's like. An airplane, when it gets to a certain level of complexity, there is a creature that kind of makes it not work. And yeah. it's kind of like the aliens in the alien movies where it's like the worst possible thing is going to happen because yeah. there's like a, a monster that essentially like preys on weakness and preys on like – and that weakness can be anything. It can be like miscommunication. It can be greed. And we tried to do that in the show where the Mogwai kind of mean different things to – all the different characters and not only just with the Mogwai, but also with the other spirit, you know, spirits and creatures from Chinese mythology. Mm-hmm. This is a very roundabout way of talking about no, it, please. but Love to it. us, to us, what was so fun about the Mogwai or the creatures that our characters um, come up against fight defeat is that it wasn't so much about, yes, there's one part of it. That's like, what is the origin of these creatures? What makes them tick? Why are they why are they bad for our characters? But the way that they force all of our characters to confront who they are, it was mm-hmm. really the 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 piece of every episode that we were really trying to get to in the writers' room. Like mm-hmm. whether it was an evil mogwai or uh, or a band of evil mogwai or um, a shapeshifter on a train or somebody who you know feeds you some tea that makes you forget what your life is like, like. What does that do to the characters and how does that conf- make them confront who they are and, and further define who they are? And mm-hmm. um, 
that was like that was one of the most fun things in the writers' room mm-hmm. is to, to to be able to tell that type of story and you know try to do it in twenty two episodes. I mean twenty two yeah uh, two twenty two minute episodes over the course yeah. of the first season. Yeah. Um, the one other thing I just want to chime in for the Mogwai part is I, I've always had sympathy for the Mogwai because there's also while they are agents of chaos, it's always humans who are they just allow they like Z said they reveal human who humans are and basically allow humans to destroy themselves. In, in, yes. in kind of in the going back to the movies and definitely in our show, it's like if humans treat Mogwai, respect the rules, treat them better, none of this happens. Yeah, it's one of the, my favorite things about the horror genre, especially creature horror, mm-hmm. is that so often the creature is just doing what they do, you know, yeah, yeah. like, and you know, it's hard to get mad at like the blob or like <laughs> aliens, you know, mm-hmm, or yeah. a zombie, you know, a zombie is just a brain dead human being who wants to eat brains. Yeah. And uh, I remember going, this is now 15 years ago, I think probably I can look at the date, but like I, uh, the one of the, I think it was diary of the dead. Mm-hmm. And I went to a screening of it and George Romero was like, he was like, ah, oh, fast zombies, ah, I hate them. <laughs> he was like, I, you know, the good thing about slow zombies is because slow zombies, the zombies are not the bad guys. It's the humans. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, he's so right. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it is in all yeah. his movies. Yeah. 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 yeah 100%. I, two, two things to say to that. One, Diary of the Dead is something that I didn't <laughs> think we would ever mention on this show because it is <laughs> one of his films that I feel like maybe we should not talk about as much, but uh, it's still worth a watch, I guess. Um, Sean and I did like a, a four hour episode with uh, some of our podcast buddies about that very yeah. interesting film. Um, but uh yeah i mean you're you're so right i mean all the evil dead movies are like don't fuck with this book oh you you did yeah. <laughs> now bad stuff's gonna like it's that's the whole yeah. thing right if if humans yeah. aren't idiots then like maybe things will be fine so yeah absolutely understand that that premise with with those metaphors in mind and i guess if this is prying too much into potential future projects then just tell me no <laughs> but uh i'm curious what uh what might be a dream uh interesting scenario to unleash gremlins in that maybe doesn't have to tie to the narrative for you present day sequel. if you had to choose yeah, yeah. if you had I to mean... pick a place to unleash them a place and a time i, I mean no grem- no no spoilers but you know, we have a second season that's almost finished yeah. of Gremlins, yep. and we definitely got to choose a place where the Mogwai chaos I find very satisfying. Um, okay, Beautiful. but also Brendan, Brendan. I mean, I feel like every night when you go to sleep, you're th- you think is, like, where where is, would Mogwai? This is what I most what I, like Mogwai to destroy. I was going to say this is literally <laughs> what I dream in. So, um, I mean, everything is is great for it. Um, the one I was going to say, and uh, inspired by. Uh, some fan art I saw years ago online. There was somebody who was putting together a pitch for like a gremlins, basically gremlins versus the American government, like the white house yeah. and Congress and all. And ever since I saw the art from that, I'm like, yeah, I, I would want, I would, I want to watch that. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. In the, yeah. in the same vein, uh, obviously like you guys are on max and owned by Warner brothers and all this different stuff. Uh, there's crossover opportunity. I feel like if you guys had to do a crossover, <laughs> what do you think there's any any very opportune crossovers that I, uh, the Mogwai would fit into? I'm not sure even if it all falls under Max, but I want the Amblin averse. Um, I want okay. uh, Goonies, Indiana Jones, and Gremlins to all end up uh, crossing over. A little inner space can even throw in there. I'm pretty sure Amblin was involved. Five yeah. uh the mouse, uh, perfect uh, sidekick yeah. to an uh, older Gizmo. I mean, yes! there's just so many Amblin uh, crossover possibilities. Isn't ET a part uh, of that? Too? Like, wouldn't ET oh, be a part of, of that course. too? Of course. There we, you go. I yeah. mean, we have to include ET. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. was not expecting an American Tale to to pop up. <laughs> wow, an American yes. Tale came up more in our writers' room than a lot of. I think it's after you go through all the horror things, an American Tale mm-hmm. came up a shocking amount in the Gremlins uh, writers' room. The, I love that. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Z, wow. what about a, you? Hapli- a hapless Aquaman, just like trying to take care of Gremlins. <laughs> sure, <and> just <laughs> having them multiply. Uh, you it's know, uh, the yeah. Sorcerer's Apprentice with uh, Aquaman yeah, and Mogwai. Yeah, and wow. or yeah. it could finally be revealed why the Titanic sunk. You know, we, there's, there's, oh. also, there's there is so many. There is so many. Wow. Yeah. I actually I am hard that. pressed. We should. That's what we should do for subsequent seasons. We should just put a bunch of words in a hat and then just pick them out and be like, "What yeah, if Mogwai anyway. attacked?" Yes, I'm yes. in Listen, full support the, of this. If, yeah, if the new Prey film 
said anything. It's mm-hmm. just take your yeah. iconic character and put them somewhere mm-hmm. else, and it'll be amazing. Um, yeah. Remlins versus Predator. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. print it. I'll take it in cash. Exactly. All right. I'm there's, ready. there's so many, so many great ideas. Um, yeah. So before we get your guys's recs and talk about anything else, uh, one thing, Z, I want to talk with you specifically about is. Uh, not gremlins related but you have a new series that your co-showrunner on coming out Mm -hmm. called i'm a virgo um which i want to say i used to work in post-production about a year ago and i i was doing post for you guys for like five (laughs) seconds and so i was like i'm glad to see that you and boots you know finished it and it it looks amazing um i'm curious like you know can you speak to kind of the the alternate reality insane vibes and 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 looks and and different things that that a a boots made series or or show you know has like this is for anyone that hasn't watched sorry to bother you or seen the trailer of of i'm a virgo i mean it seemed like you know you guys were probably just working off of like vfx plates for like all of your first cuts because of all the insane stuff that's going on um so i'm really curious like what that's like going i mean you're working in animation uh in animation medium and then you're going into um this crazy vfx 13 foot person world um what is that like yeah i mean so the main the main care the, the show is about a a 13 foot tall black man growing up in oakland he's 19 years old and he it goes out into the world for the first time and um we tried to shoot as much practically as possible i mean there's certainly mm-hmm. things like there are spoilers like also like small people in the show yeah. um <laughs> and so we had one of the things that we did was um, we tried to use a different technique, multiple techniques in each scene. That way the audience couldn't kind of put their finger on exactly what we were doing. Um, mm. Boots directed all the episodes, did an incredible job. Um, but it was, you know, it was incredibly kind of like labor intensive and um, highly technical shooting. Mm. And uh, it is funny now that we're talking about it all in, in, in one go, like, gremlins who used to be puppets we did animated and then like a human a show about humans yes. we use puppets for that's why that's why i had to bring it up <laughs> yep exactly and um you know i think that the practical wanted to shoot things practically it just we wanted it to have a very handmade feel to it which mm-hmm. is um you know sorry to bother you a lot of the stuff that they did were um you know by necessity independent film um, but then bringing that kind of handmade feel to the show was something that was really important to us. And, um, you know, we, we, we watched a lot of behind the scenes stuff. We watched like, um, we've been telling everyone that's like Lord of the Rings behind the scenes that we did watch that, but oh, we did also watch a lot of, um, elf behind the scenes stuff because <laughs> that is, uh, yeah. that is, a some of the best forced, uh, perspective yeah. work yep. where, yeah. you know, the character is half as close to the camera, but in the story on the same plane as, um, as the smaller characters. Yeah. they need, um, yeah. But yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a fun and exhausting shoot. And I'm really excited that, um, that people are going to be able to see it. And it, it is wild that we finished two seasons of writing gremlins. Then I went off and oh. co-show ran that with boots and they're coming out like within the same month and just goes to show animation takes some time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I'm I'm very excited to see that. Uh, it's something I've been stoked for. I was at South by and I saw they had like a the like pink Cadillac driving around with uh, yeah. Drell's character on the back, which was amazing. Um, so stoked yeah. on that too. So um, as I just mentioned, uh, and I as we told you guys before at the end of our show, uh, we like to ask our guests for what we call mostly horror recommendations, which is essentially one horror film and then a non-horror film that you would recommend to our listeners i'll even open it up you know you guys are both comic book folk if you'd like to recommend a comic that's totally fine as well uh you know tap into that universe um brendan we can have you go first if you want to uh recommend one in one for our listeners absolutely uh so yeah on the horror front um it's fine i was gonna go with it i've seen some things i've really enjoyed more recently but i feel like my biggest wreck for like the last two years has been psycho gorman um, and I want to recommend that here because also just tonally, I feel like it is the best so fit fun. in terms of horror comedy. It's also weirdly very Amblin-esque because I always describe Psycho Gorman as um, if E.T. was made by Troma. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, yep. uh, it is just utterly hilarious. Like the jokes are nonstop, but so deadpan and so committed to the bit. Um, and then also the gore effects are so over the top and hilarious and amazing. Like Steve Kaczynski just gets tone incredibly well. And it's amazing what he can pull off um, on the scale that he has there and the budget that he has there. So Psycho yeah. Gorman, it just, I've rewatched it like every few months. I'll just basically put it back on and it just brings a smile to my face. So that's on the horror side. Um, and about as far away as a type of movie as possible. Uh, streaming right now uh, is a movie called A Thousand and One. It's the best drama I've seen in a long time. It's um, a mother gets out of prison and finds her, uh, I think about seven-year-old when the movie begins, a uh, kid mm -hmm. who's kind of estranged from her. And it's trying to reunite with him, which I they feel like the initial scenes, you're almost feeling like, oh, it's going to be like a really sad, precious type of feature. It's not, it moves through time and uses New York City in a way. I learned only afterwards that it was originally a stage play, which I wouldn't have guessed because it doesn't feel constrained like that. But um, it's just this really interesting, ultimately covers like, about, like probably 15 years of these characters' lives. Um, and just constantly surprising and like the lead actress is utterly amazing. So yeah, 1001. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sold. I yep. am sold. Um, it's funny that you brought up 1001 because I, I was thinking about this because you guys are obviously like uh, horror aficionados and I was trying to think of something that maybe people would not have brought up on the show before. And I was thinking about um, 2001, which obviously most people think of as like a space opera. But to me, it's mm -hmm. a horror movie because you're basically sure. living inside of the murderer and obviously there are things like pacing and um uh production design and acting that don't necessarily feel like a horror movie but if you look at the structure of it to me it's like horror that becomes cosmic horror by the end sure, because yeah. there's something that is kind of yeah. undefinable that's happening yeah mm -hmm. it's funny because when you read the book the book is much more explicit about what's occurring especially towards the, like the last third of the mm -hmm. of the of the of the story but that to me, I've watched a bunch of times just thinking like, oh, I'm watching like a like a very deliberately paced, paced horror movie. And I've always just tried to think of like, what are some things that are um, kind of like horror adjacent that still like take those boxes? So that's, yeah. that's, that, that's my... That's my left of center horror. <laughs> that's that's, that's I, mostly horror. That's why yeah, our name yeah, is our that's, name. That's <laughs> what our show is about. I do yep, want to ask exactly. with that, would you recommend the movie or the book as like a, a better experience for that story specifically? So do you want that explanation you know, or do you think it's better without it? You know, that the last part of the book is a little bit more, um, I think like purposefully pedestrian in terms of like he's in a way station, but it doesn't look like it does in 2001. Um, sure. It's hard to say because – when you read the, I read the book after I watched the movie. So some of those images were obviously like imprinted on my mind. Right. Yeah. Um, of course. But I, I also feel like I, if I remember correctly, they were kind of worked on in tandem. Um, and so I think somewhat similar to like, I think the Godfather was also like this where mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. maybe there was like a treatment and they were working on it in tandem. Um, so it's just really interesting. I mean, it's like two different um, geniuses working in two different mediums kind of simultaneously, but sharing some of the same, story thrust and data points. Um, there's one thing that I find really interesting in the book, actually, that is not in the movie. It's never explicitly said in the movie, but um, you know, all the astronauts in the movie are very calm, cool, and collected, um, which usually when you watch anything where if, clearly if you're an astronaut or a pilot, you have to be like pretty chill, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the movie, uh, in the book, they kind of explain it that they tried to, find astronauts who were very even keeled because they would have to be spending a lot of time together. And so that's part of the reason why they're not particularly like um, hot headed or their mm. reactions are very muted. And I just thought that was like really interesting. Um, yeah. And it explains a lot about the, the performances in the movie. Sure. Yeah. The psychology behind it. Yeah. Um, in terms of my non horror recommendation, which still has a couple horror ish scenes. It's one that was a big influence on gremlins uh, Kung Fu hustle. Uh, and Kung oh, yeah. Fu Hustle by Stephen Chow has, it takes place in this one kind of like courtyard um, with like Chinese gangsters and there's a lot of Kung Fu in it, obviously, but there's also a lot of supernatural stuff. And even the Kung Fu has a supernatural element to it. And there's a couple scenes where um, there's kind of bad guys who 
play a Chinese instrument and they strum the strings and the strings shoot out and like, like lop off limbs and heads of yep. its victims. And it's just like, it's a, it's a little five minute, like true horror segue. It takes place at night. Lighting is like lit by moonlight. And it's just, what's really cool about that movie is it's got Kung Fu. It's got comedy. It's got horror. Um, and it also is just this really unique tone um, that, uh, that yeah. we really appreciate. And we watched mm-hmm. a lot in the, in the, in the writer's room. I haven't seen it in years, oh. so it sounds so like it's good. time for a yeah. re-up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hold up. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, guys, thank you again so much for being on the show. Thank you for your recommendations. Uh, thank you for the wonderful series, obviously, that we both enjoy. Um, before we let you go, I, I know I already said the I'm a Virgo part of this, but anything that you guys want to plug or mention uh, you know, outside of Gremlins that's coming up soon? Just Gremlins for now. Uh, and Gremlins Just... Season 2 at some point in the next year or so, hopefully. Hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have, they're doing an interesting way of releasing the show, um, and it makes sense for Gremlins in particular, because we're doing two episodes every Thursday, and so for the Mm -hmm. next, until June 22nd, um, when we have our season finale, it'll be two episodes every Thursday, and, um, you know, I'm I'm excited that we had a release that spanned a a number of weeks, but I also Mm -hmm. feel like, because the episodes are so short, you could definitely watch the whole series uh, after um, the season finale premieres and watch it all like kind of one long movie. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'm a Virgo comes out June 23rd. And if you are a comic book fan, please follow, you know, TKO presents. Uh, we've got uh, TKO presents.com. We've got a lot of great books and a lot of horror books. Mm-hmm. Heck oh, yeah. yeah. And Sean's uh, going to buy one as soon as we're done. <laughs> uh, well, A, 100%. But B, I want to say that uh, a couple days ago, I watched Gremlins 2 and then binged the entire show. And it was a great way to spend <laughs> a day. Uh, highly awesome. recommend to all listeners. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. I love that. I love that. Well, listen, yeah. Brendan Z, we really appreciate the time. Uh, if you guys are listening to this, obviously check out the series on Max now. Watch Gremlins 2 and then binge it all the way through like Sean did. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll chat uh, sometime when season two drops. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to our interview with Z Chun and Brendan Hay from Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai. Um, again, if you guys haven't already checked out that show, hop on over to Max, or as I like to call it, HBO Max, and watch it now. Um, before we get into this week's mostly horror recommendations from, from your mostly horror hosts, Sean finally finished Yellow Jackets season two. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> and so, obviously, if you guys haven't watched Yellow Jackets, we recommend that you do so. And if you don't want do any it. spoilers, you should jump ahead or maybe just yep. end the episode here. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we should talk about it. I, I want to know you. I want to know your thoughts. Me, me first. Me first. You first. You first. Yeah. You okay. First. So I'm gonna start my thoughts by restating a thought that you told me and going with that to begin. But I remember, you know, season okay. two, it, you didn't love season two right off the bat. And I think I can understand Correct. that. Um, yep. There are, there are, and it's not that you didn't like it. You just didn't love it as much um, as mm-hmm. the first season. I can understand that. I think that it, it did kind of take me a second to like fully readjust, even though I was just mainly my excitement for the show coming back, kept me through, but there are mm-hmm. things feel a little, a little wiggly. Um, and then Wiggly is just the best word that I could think of for that. Um, but I also, there were a couple moments that kind of felt like almost soap soapy to me. Um, and I don't know if you would agree with that at all, but just like certain dialogue and it would only be for like a moment, truly not even a full scene. There's a bit of soap in yellow jackets for sure. I, I guess I just, I didn't feel it as much in the first season. Um, yeah, but holy shit, dude, this, this season, like other than, than a couple moments at, at most where you, where you feel that or, or a slightly slow beginning, I think that this season delivered. I think that a ton of shit happened. We learned mm. some stuff, things kept getting darker, which I really appreciate. I, I love this show's willingness to not pull any punches and, uh, and yeah, man, it's just so much fucked up things happen and I loved it and I hate that I have to wait for more um 
that's like a general overview. Yeah. And then what about you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I think about four episodes into the season, we were walking like we just gotten frozen yogurt or something and we we're walking home. And I was saying that I wasn't really feeling it. Like it was, you know, okay. Yeah. Um, but the first couple episodes just weren't really hitting for me. And I think, and again, big spoilers here, please skip if you haven't watched yellow jackets. Um, but once, uh, once fucking what's her name shauna Shauna. once shauna has her baby yeah um and you realize that she she did not have her baby or she did have her baby but the baby not not a baby um things yeah go downhill in a great way they really stay dark they don't like get any better um yeah i you know the the episode with where they all um, start the hunt essentially with um, the, them chasing Nat and Nat letting Javi die. Um, yeah, holy that shit. was in, that was intense. So and, intense, and great. Um, there were some really good spooky moments, like um, old uh, modern day Taisa, mm. um, like when it's the end of one of the episodes, but Van is going to like grab her pills back. And yeah, modern day Taisa is like in spooky mode. <laughs> she like walks up to her and is like, "We're not where we need to be," or something like that. Like she's like really freaky. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. Um. And obviously, you know, you're getting the dark, the dark nature of um, the girls like in the flat in the you know flashback um, moments. I mean, you mm-hmm. Shauna beating the shit out of um, dude. Lottie out of fucking Lottie was insane. I love Dude. moments like that. I think that those yeah. are like great. And the it's a, it was a great moment of like, in case you forgot, this is what this is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. in case you forgot, like, here's here's the fucking mood back. Um, you know, I loved. Uh, yeah, I, I really thought they they stuck the landing. And I, I also am of the mind that like you can't just keep a show going with all the main characters intact. Like you need to yeah. cut, you need to kill someone like, or, right. Or someone needs something to happen to them or, you know, like you need, there needs to be stakes in your world. Yes. Um, specifically in the new world, you know, like people are going to die yeah. in the flashbacks. We know that because we haven't seen every, everyone in the modern day, but the fact mm-hmm. that again, huge fucking mega spoiler, the fact yeah. that Nat dies, was so good i you know i don't know if i was 100 percent happy about like everything about the way that it happened but i really i told sydney this i was like i really need someone to die at the end of this episode i think that they need Mm -hmm. that going into you know going into the next um season and in my opinion i think that they also need that to make sure that you don't only care about the flashbacks like that's kind of the place that i was in i was like I was like, we know that the flashbacks are only going to get like more haunting and the girls are only going to get crazier, mm-hmm. but like what's going to happen in the real world or in the modern day world. Yeah. And so I'm glad that we saw like shit's also going to get insane there too. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I was a big fan of it. Um, loved Elijah Wood in this season. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was, you know, obviously in and out, but that last episode he was immaculate um, yes. and would love to get him on the show. Um, oh, dude. But yeah. It's just a matter big, of time. Yeah, big big fan. I also will say, I know you're saying you're bummed that you have to wait, um, but uh, Entertainment Weekly reported, um, uh, where is the single the... episode? That's yeah. There's gonna be a bo- yeah. a bonus episode. Um, although it's a I don't Christmas know. Special. Yeah, that would be really fucking cool to be honest with you. But <laughs> I don't know um, what's gonna happen because of the writer strike. Um, so yeah. I don't know if that's gonna if that's like an episode that's already done or you know what what is going to happen um my question for you is what do you think happens from here in the flashback well okay well a couple things a i was not expecting nat's uh lottie you know kind of appointing nat as uh as the new leader and i think that that is going oh i don't think i did pretty interesting Yeah, yeah, I I definitely did not see that coming. And also, I think that there's implications with that. It's, you know, Lottie can say, and I'm sure that she means, I don't think that Lottie is like conniving, um, but she can appoint someone to be leader. But but even like, it's not like a true exchange of power. You know, people still see 
Lottie as like the wise one, the spiritual one. Well, um, Mari's like in love with her. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. In love with Lottie, um, essentially. But but I feel like Lottie could revoke Nat's status, you know? Um, so it's almost yeah. like a second chain in command in this weird, weird way. So I'm curious. I feel like there's going to be some power dynamic struggles is basically what I want to say. I think that, you know, we saw Coach. I don't remember what his name is. Ben. But yeah, so Ben decided to, ben. you know, that they've been... What, what you got there, Ben? Fire. Fire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little Olin Rogers, some balloon shot for you guys. Um, yeah, man. I uh, I think that, you know, seeing him kind of turn like this, I, I don't really... Yeah. It, it's so interesting to see him, you know, think that they are, are like monsters now. Um, but you know, like that makes sense to me, but then for him to do that just almost doesn't make sense to me. Like, I wonder if he's just in this weird manic state. I'm trying to figure that out, but I think they're going to hunt him down. Um, Oh yeah. I, I think a thing that I could see happening is, so he's been hanging out in the tree. They just lost their place. So I think they're going to find him in the tree. They're going to eat him. Um, he might be the first like real hunt that, cause we still haven't mm-hmm. seen a full, what, what, what will become the ritualistic hunt. Um, what was teased seen bits in episode one at it. the yeah. beginning of episode one. Right. Yeah. And we've seen it throughout, like when the girls all got really high on Missy's uh, soup, mm-hmm. you know, like that was, that was a hunt. And then, you know, chasing Nat was a hunt. Obviously we saw the eating part of eating, um, Jackie. So I think it's all going to fuse together and he might be yeah. kind of the first. Um, but then I think they're all going to move into the tree and the tree is whatever, whatever being or, or group psychosis that they're having. I think that the tree is really going to the, once they oh, get yeah. to the tree, everything's going to jump up. I do want to say that. Um, no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, what's her, it? Taisha. Ty. Um, Taisa. 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 Mm-hmm her like double plot to me is for some reason it's more interesting to me in the past um it hasn't like fully landed in the future and in both cases i'm like how exactly are you gonna tie this in like i i hoping that it's not just an element that they wanted and they don't know what they're doing with it yet like i hope that they have Mm -hmm. it all figured out because i'm worried about that being either left unanswered or like underwhelming or kind of taking away from from the rest of it yeah. which feels more like ambiguous does that make sense um yeah I, well like, this this is where it's like you know i know that you don't always have to explain everything but i feel like with a show that's going this long we at least need some sort of mythos um i i feel like you at least need some sort of mythos because you know you you're gonna need to explain the the people that Thaisa saw when of she course. was in her other you know what I mean like the and then like Lottie was speaking French like there has something to do with like a Frenchman and like I don't know oh, there's yeah there's there's a yeah there's a bit that you just need explained and so I feel like yeah. hopefully they have like a at least a basic mythos of like what's going on yeah. um all and like you know they're not gonna figure it out in the past they're gonna figure it out in the modern day um right but like that's i'm i'm i don't even know what's gonna happen in the modern day now like why he's going to a psych ward probably and like what happens mm-hmm. with taisa and like she's still you know she still has the double stuff going on van is kind of just van and shauna is pretty much exonerated now because like the police stuff got figured out essentially um <coughs> So yeah, it's I don't really know. They're they're doing a good job of like shits in the air. Yeah, I kind of feel like <coughs> I forgot. I wanted to say this. Sorry guys. I uh I inhaled my water. Um <laughs> Van, Van is such a <coughs> a frustrating and interesting character to me. Um she is like I, I definitely enjoy her in the past, and New Van yeah. is kind of scary to me. Seeing how she handled <coughs> the the whole thing that they were going to do with Lottie um, makes mm-hmm. me think that Van has been itching to get back. I think that so when whatever animalistic thing was released in them, Van never fully put it back. Never wanted to put it back yeah. entirely. You know, I think she has missed. Um, that that primalness i think they all have to some degree but van it's clearly in her and i think uh 
<clears throat> she's also a lot more into like the spiritual side of it. Like she, I can't tell if she's, if she's willing to do the violence because she's truly, because she truly believes everything that Lottie used to say. And she's still stuck in that mindset. Or if she uses it regardless to justify the, the taste that she got for, for the violence and for the primal stuff. Yeah. She's Does that just like sense? fucked up now. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah, she yep. just needs it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, either way, stoked to see what happens, and I just hope that this series doesn't fall apart with over-explaining or or under. I I'm I think that yeah. it's they're killing it so far, and I think mm-hmm. what they're doing is is difficult. And I think uh, I just hope that they that they nail it the way they've been nailing it, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> I agree. Excited. Um, mostly horror wrecks. <laughs> Let's do it quick because we're going to go see Boogeyman, which we'll talk about in the next episode. Um, yeah. You got Rex? Do you want me to go first? You can go first, but I, I do have a Rex. It's kind of a cheat, right. but it's it's valid. Mine's, yeah, mine uh, I just saw yesterday, two days ago. Yesterday? Um, yesterday, uh, Spider-Man <laughs> Across the Spider-Verse. Fuck. It's yeah. so good. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, go see it. It It is worth um uh, obviously it's worth the money but it's it's amazing right. it's just as good if not better as the first one um you know fucking like a thousand animators working on this film it it yeah. shows it's beautiful the writing is so good the characters are so good the voice acting is so good the story is so good um it's just the, the soundtrack is so good um it's really just a phenomenal film so that's my my rec, it is, is uh the new Spider-Man film. It is the the first the first uh you know the Spider-Man movie. what are what are these ones called how do I differentiate them is it In, the amazing Into the Spider-Verse It's Spider-Verse Spider-Verse, Spider-Verse is wow brain I was like there's there's yeah. a word there that I'm supposed to grab right now yeah. um the first the sp- the first Spider-Verse movie changed animation like it, it just kind of changed yeah. like expectations and and technology and you can see that directly uh with the new tmnt, TMNT. that's coming out uh yeah so i i still have not seen two as you know but uh very excited to see it uh and support his rec even without having seen it my rec so is good. like i said it's a little bit of a cheat but i think it's important. i know what it is probably um is it gremlins what it's not gremlins it... oh dang it all right it's Gremlins 2. Oh, son <laughs> I, of a bitch. I, so the reason that I want to stress that is that I think um I could be I could be wrong here. I'm sure that there are plenty of Gremlins fans listening that watch both on a somewhat regular basis, annual. But I know that I had seen both, but usually when I do a rewatch uh of any kind, I, I rewatch the first one. Mm-hmm. It had been a long time since I watched two, and I definitely like two more than I like one. Two is awesome. If you haven't seen it in a minute, highly recommend. It's so funny. It brings in so many elements um, that will particularly be of use to you and interesting when you watch the series. Um, if you have not started that yet, and yeah, dude, they just get really wonky and they really like clean up Gizmo's design and and obviously all the Mogwai's design. Um, yeah, so if it's been a minute since you've seen two, check it out. And it takes place here in New York, which is fun. Oh yeah, Gremlins Two: yep. Lost in New York. That's what it's called, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah gremlins take manhattan exactly yeah uh yeah. on that note thank you guys as always for listening send us an email mostly horror movie night at gmail.com tell us about your recommendations for this week tell them tell us if you like gremlins Gosh, tell no. us if tell us what you think about aliens that's honestly the most important thing you could do if you've made it to this point in the conversation tell us about aliens tell us what you think about aliens yeah. if you're full tinfoil hat like sean is if there's aliens in the oceans send us an email you can also do that over twitter where we are at mostly horror pod. Um, just kidding. Our Twitter is just mostly horror. We're mostly horror pod on Instagram. If it's confusing to you, just look up mostly horror. You'll find our socials find everywhere. Us. We also have We're a TikTok, there. which is mostly horror. Um, if you want to follow me and see what I say, I'm on <laughs> Twitter and Instagram at Stephen is he average. Sometimes Sean is on all the socials at hypocrite Inc or hypocrite dot Inc. Mm-hmm. That's all we got for you this week. We're going to go get spooked by the boogeyman, and we will catch you in the next one. Peace.